Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So I want to thank you very much for tuning into my show th this morning. Uh, we are going to be talking to Christopher Chase Rachels, who's a very special guest on the show today. And he's going to be talking a little bit about the Blue Ridge Liberty Project down near Asheville, uh, North Carolina. And he's also going to be talking about his upcoming book, The Free Market Manifesto, which I'm, I'm excited about to talk on both topics with him. Uh, Cr Chase, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for Cora. I'm very happy to be here. Great. So um, why don't you start out with just uh, telling me a little bit about the Blue Ridge Liberty Project and some of the goals that you guys have in mind and some of the ideas that you want to put in place with um, this uh, society that you guys are setting up down there. Sure, I'd be very happy to. Well, very basically, the Blue Ridge Liberty Project is just a voluntarist and peaceful parenting organization. And what that means is people who are part of it want to promote those ideas and on top of just being an activist organization, promoting education, awareness of these ideas, we also want to form an actual community where like-minded people can live together and actually uh, utilize uh, local support infrastructure to help us actually see these ideas come to fruition, whether they be the agorism stuff, uh, better unschooling methods, peaceful parenting, and of course there's also the synergistic effect with the more people you have the more opportunities you have for that sort of activism, whether it's outreach or agorism or whatever else. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you guys um, are implementing it. I mean, I'm very excited to see a free society in action. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm very excited to see how we can form things and how we can organize people together without using a centralized, coercive organization. People have this strange idea that you have to have this uh, coercion in order to have a society, this tight-knit group of people all helping each other and things like that. You have to have coercion in order to do that. So how, how is it that you guys are putting this together without coercion? Well, it's, it's, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, because we've advertised ourselves as a voluntarist and um, a peaceful parenting organization, the people who tend to move here for the BRLP kind of filter themselves in a sense that they're either very friendly with these ideas or they consider themselves to be voluntarists or peaceful parents themselves. So we don't really have to do much in the way of, you know, uh, quality checking the people who are here. That kind of happens organically. But on top of that, there's not like a specific blueprint to how we're achieving this because it's a de because it is a decentralized organization. So basically if someone has a unique way they want to promote a certain idea or they want to establish some sort of agorist infrastructure or they want to help promote the use of peaceful parenting or unschooling they pretty much have the freedom to do so and, and to offer those um, ideas to the group and just by kind of sort of consensus based uh, methods we decide whether or not we want to throw a bunch of resources behind it or not or help advertise and we, and we generally do advertise all the ideas that um, that get uh, offered. The only real things that we don't do and we try to stay away from are kind of things which antagonize the local state officials, you know, like getting in a cop's face and blowing the joint in his face or whatever, or, you know, trying to provoke conflict where it isn't already occurring. And the other thing that we really stay away from is any sort of direct political action like campaigning and things of that nature. So outside of those two things, uh, there's pretty much uh, an innumerable amount of methods we use to promote these ideas. Um, some of the ones we've actually employed have ranged from going to just anti-war protests, anti-circumcision protests, speaking at libertarian conferences, attending Students for Liberty conferences and spreading our organization or ideas there. Uh, we've spoken at the Anarchy and NYC conference. We've held things ranging from empathy circles, which we think is really important to really getting people to open up to these ideas, to having unschooling meetings, which actually invite people who aren't even in the know of the voluntarist uh, philosophy, but do really do like the unschooling peaceful parenting aspect. And of course, when they're hanging out with people like us, uh, we're it's a personable way to which we can introduce those ideas to them accordingly. And of course, we'll work with other like-minded organizations. We for common causes. We've worked with the Asheville Normal Organization for the promotion of cannabis awareness and how, you know, consuming cannabis or distributing it is in itself not criminal or aggressive. Um, why, it's, why it's silly to enforce this victimless so-called crime. Uh, we've spoken out at 
community conferences. Like recently, we went to a community conference where they were discussing the use of force from the police, and we've spoken out there. Um, we have out done outreach at the local university before, you know, telling kids about these ideas, implementing them. And but more than just the, like I said, more than just the education and outreach, we're also promoting the agorist ventures. We have many people part of our organization who are doing businesses off the books, they aren't paying taxes, or they're trading in Bitcoin. And as the more of us get here, the more of a division of labor we're creating in that agorist sort of market, so to speak. And finally, it's just another big attractive factor about this area here is the community. Unlike other places like the FSP, at least what I experienced, people here are very tight-knit. We we are very much here to support each other through different hard times. If someone needs a place to stay until they get on their feet, we are able to help provide that, a couch to sleep on. We have many events to which we're all hanging out and socializing and getting together. And really just more than, like I said, spreading the ideas, we're creating that community. And I think having that tangible community present makes our message that much more compelling because more than just this abstract theory we're promoting, we're actually showing them this being put into practice. And like I said, as we grow, it's becoming more and more of a reality. And, and that's what I think is really so exciting about what you guys are doing down there is that you're actually living these values and you're bringing about a peaceful society in your own lives and actually acting it out for other people to see that behavior and to really get an idea of what a free and voluntary society can look like. I mean, you mentioned helping people. That's almost uh, unknown to people when they think about a voluntary society. They, they think that you need coercion to have communities. You need a country to have communities. And so mm -hmm. absent that, we're really kind of showing an example of how this can be otherwise. And uh, I really appreciate what you guys are doing and, and doing outreach and, and actually getting out to people to spread this knowledge, which is what I'm trying to do with this radio show and staying away from the political system. Politics for me has uh, always led to a end of nothing. Uh, they have not, it <laughs> hasn't really worked at all for me. I mean, I, I actually right. tried to run for mayor a long time ago, back when I believed in the political system. And, uh, it, you know, there's just so many special interests. There's so many people who are uh, vying for state power that there's really no escaping the uh, the, the special interests pushing for those special privileges. And when you get consolidated interests in the centralized coercive unit, then your disparate people who are um, unable to really defend themselves against those consolidated interests because they're so strong. Um, exactly. you, you really don't get anywhere. You're just spinning your wheels. Um, so uh, we're up in Connecticut again. And so maybe some of my listeners don't know um, some of the things about what you were talking about, especially concerning peaceful parenting and unschooling. I talk a lot about economics here on the show, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on those two topics in particular. Right, and I can definitely provide a, a sort of basic outline of peaceful parenting and unschooling. I'm definitely not the expert in those fields, but generally speaking, peaceful parenting, first and foremost, is just refusing to implement corporal punishment in the rearing of your child. Corporal punishment being you know, smacking, hitting, physically interfering with them in any way as a means of punishment, right? Or it could even be, uh, you know, like screaming or verbally abusing and, and shaming, things like that. Instead of using these things to dominate and establish a sort of superior subordinate dynamic with your child, we're promoting instead a more of a, a mentor uh, a kind of relationship where you're there to help guide the child, to be a resource for the child. You're there, of course, to help provide resources for his or her sustenance, uh, but you're teaching them the different social mores and the world in which they live in a, in a, in a way to where you're encouraging critical thinking, negotiation, not just compliance and obedience. So you're going to encourage them to question some of your preferences that you, you you have for them like hey let's let's go to the store and I, and I would like for us to eat this you know and you'd be open to them saying no maybe I don't want to eat this maybe I want to eat that and you're at least allowing them the opportunity to engage in that sort of kind of inquiry and so what this does is it creates within them it, it kind of uh, motivates them and enables them to really develop their critical thinking apparatuses to not just take authority for authority's sake 
Um, and this really is going to help them not only become happier, healthier, more intelligent, I would say, individuals, but it's going to prevent them from becoming prey to the sort of predations and, and propaganda that is pervaded by the state itself. And I think that's the danger of most parenting today is because, you know, one person was spanked or yelled at or screamed at or domineered as a child. They're much more susceptible to accepting systems which kind of emulate the same sort of characteristics, which, of course, the most notable that we're concerned with is the state itself. So not only is peaceful parenting, I think, just a better way to parent, but it also is another method to kind of uh, degrade state power itself in one of I would say uh, the most critical means to actually achieving a voluntary, free, or anarchic society. And I, I really appreciate what you were saying there because um, I see a couple similarities in both the parenting style that you just described and also the society that you guys are forming down there. Um, you are guy, you guys are being an example, uh, being guidance for the child instead of actually going over and telling that child what they should actually do. You're, you're kind of exhibiting the preferences and exhibiting the uh, behavior that you'd like to see in that child and also not dominating them with threats of coercion as of course the state does to society. And so um, I see these similarities and, and what I love about libert libertarianism and uh, uh, voluntarism is the consistency that we apply the principles that we see in our own lives and also in society as a whole in general. Yes, it, it, I, I totally agree with you. It really is incredible the extent to which the implications of NAP travel. How it's not just about a relationship with the state, but it's also about our relationship with each other and I would say especially with our children first and foremost. And um, I don't want this to be confused as is so often done with, oh, well, you're just going to be the most permissive parent and let your child, you know, go crazy and, and just do whatever they want to, whether it's running out in front of cars or damaging people's properties. And it's none of that stuff. It's more so just putting the onus of the situations back on the parent where you don't put the child in a situation to where he's going to be able to violate someone's property rights or to put himself in mortal danger and you try to avoid proactively these sorts of situations and in the meantime you're still teaching them about the world around them so that when they encounter these situations and there's not that kind of safety net there they kind of have a sort of basis of how to know to react to them of what to do what maybe not be so smart as far as their own safety or concern is or as far as how it affects others and their feelings or their property creating a more empathetic and more considerate individual, basically. And, and again, I, I see this consistency. Uh, we see, I, I mean, I would not allow my friends to just do anything. I don't uh, allow them the permission to just, you know, run roughshod over me and, and demand things from me and make me pay for dinner all the time. You know, I, I demand a certain amount of accountability and um, not permissiveness in my relationships as a whole. And so right. again, that's the same thing with a child. You know, you, you don't just let them do anything that they want, but it's a give and take. It's a, it's a relationship. It's a communication and a negotiation about where we all can go, as opposed to this kind of authoritarian, I know what's best for you, and therefore I'm going to tell you what it is that you can and cannot do. Right, exactly. And I think that's a good way to formulate it. It's it's not so much you're putting the child above yourself. It's not the opposite spectrum, right? Like whereas the traditional parenting is the parent's putting himself in a position of superiority or the child dump a uh, dominant position over the child. It's not just reversing that to where the child is now in a dominant position over the parent. Like you said, it's creating a mutual reciprocal relationship between the, the child and the parent. So what's important to make this work very well too is for the parent not just to be able to, you know, um, promulgate these ideas, but to also live by them, to lead by example, if you will. And so when you're leading by example, they're going to be much more influenced by what you do, I would say, than by what you say. So as you're respecting their preferences, you show them respect, that's what they're going to know about life and what's around them, and they're going to act in kind. Absolutely. And uh, to all my listeners who are just tuning in now, I'm chatting with uh, Christopher Chase Rachels down in Asheville, North Carolina. We've been talking about the Blue Ridge Liberty Project down there. And Chase, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your uh, upcoming book, The Free Market Manifesto, that you are uh, going to be publishing at some point. Right, definitely. I'd love to talk about that. Uh, basically, this is supposed to be a comprehensive uh, case for free market anarchism. 
And what it starts off by doing is justifying the very fundamentals, the theory. Um, how do we know what we know? So there's like an epistemology chapter. Then it's how do we know that the non-aggression principle or self-ownership or property rights are valid, right? So I talk about this in the chapter. And I talk about property, its scope, its parameters, what is property, what's not really property. I talk about contracts, enforceable, non-enforceable, insurance. Then I, I lead into this discussion of practical applications such as fields of how would medicine work? What about the, the supposed threat of monopolies and cartels? What about environmental issues? What about law and order? What about so-called uh, national defense? Uh, what about education, poverty, the corporation? So basically, those things which are traditionally either run or regulated by the state, how would they either be run or regulated in a free market society? And instead of really d detailing exactly how they be run, because that's impossible to d predict, what I do instead is show why the economic incentives are aligned much more appropriately for them to run much more uh, efficaciously and cheaply and furthermore why they are going to be running more ethically as they're all voluntarily produced and patronized and so it's kind of the full spectrum comprehensive argument for free market anarchism and against the state and I think it's going to serve as a very invaluable guide to not just people who are unfamiliar with the philosophy, but other uh, self-proclaimed volunteers themselves who are desperately searching for a way to convey and assure people who have these immediate concerns that they will be uh, adequately addressed and taken care of in such a society. Well, it sounds like a, it sounds like a good... A uh, comprehensive book, and and uh, Lou Rockwell just recently released his book against the state and an anarcho-capitalist manifesto, which I'm excited to read. I haven't actually read yet, and uh, I'll also be excited to read uh, your book, Chase. And uh, maybe we can talk about one particular topic. I've been talking a lot about uh, national defense and defense of property and the mm -hmm. uh, recent police brutality that's been uh, almost ubiquitous in our society. I mean, it seems so commonplace now that you hear about it almost every single day on the news or maybe not on the news, but it's certainly on my uh, feeds and channels. Cop Block um, has been a great resource in kind of documenting some of the problems with the police. Maybe you can go over some of the disincentives that the police and the government uh, protection of property rights have to actually protect people. And uh, maybe you can talk about some of the alternatives that we have as a competing kind of private security force organizations that may be able to provide those uh, products much cheaper and better. Sure. And I'll, I'll definitely go over the basics, but it certainly won't be exhaustive. Um, however, the most obvious and main disincentives for the police force today is, first of all, it's, it's a monopoly, right? Um, no one is legally allowed to have any superior jurisdiction or even equal jurisdiction to that of the, the police force that exists, whether that's of state, local, or federal. There can be no private entity which has equal or greater jurisdiction to them. So what this means is that because they don't have any competition, uh, tempering their uh, quality of their services or, or the price of them, the, the price is generally going to go up and the quality go down. And in fact, it's in their interest to allow crime, so-called crime, to fester because as crime festers, this serves as grounds to justify ever-increasing expenditures for their security apparatus. Whereas if you had a private alternative providing security under with competition, if crime festers in, in areas in which a certain uh, private security institution was supposed to be responsible for, and they would likely lose money and market share to their competitors who were producing better results, so to speak. So there's the incentive issue. And there's also, of course, the calculation issue, which has to do with economics, which is the fact that because people aren't voluntarily paying for these services, they're being coercively paying for them, there's no way to know if what their, their output of them is worth more than the input. Meaning that if you are, to kind of shed more light on this, if you are a... Uh, private security service, you would ask for a certain price for your services. So when people pay that price, that's your income, and you'd be able to kind of uh, match your income with your expenses that it takes to actually perform the service to an adequate level that you promised your customer. And if the expenses to actually provide that service outweighed your the price that you were charging, you would know that you would need to either increase your price or change the way in which you're performing the service. 
So you'd have some objective data to tell you whether or not your service was actually providing value to society or destroying value. And of course, they don't change their behavior and they continue making losses. They'll eventually lose all their resources and go bankrupt. And then the next guy will now have access to those freed up resources to conduct this service more efficiently. No such mechanism exists for the state, though. Uh, it exists despite the satisfactions of its customers. And they kind of give you this sort of facade that we have choice and accountability because we can kind of change out the people in authority, but the institution itself stays intact. And in fact, it usually enhances in power and scope um, as time progresses. So I think that's kind of a, a, a very basic, brief overview of, of why the security apparatus that's monopolized by the state is going to almost inevitably be much more inefficient, not to mention unethical, since it's coercively funded than its private counterparts, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, talking a little bit about the incentives that they have, uh, they actually have an incentive, like most government institutions, to increase whatever it is that they are uh, trying to combat, the increase the uh, prevalence of those things actually occurring. Because then again, they get more money. If the, uh, if the schools don't do very well and they, they, they have a bunch of uh, students who are illiterate when they are actually released out into the world, well, we just need more money. And so they have to raise taxes. They have to give more money to the government. It's like a plumber who comes in and uh, you know messes up all your pipes and there's water water flowing all over the place and he says well you just have to give me a little bit more money and then I'm going to solve the problem for you but he <laughs> was the one that actually created more of a problem than was there beforehand and now he's saying that he wants more money and I think that that same incentive kind of exists in the public sector when they're providing defense services um, I was just mm -hmm. reading about Elliot Rogers recently and uh, the the serial mass murderer over in um, I think Beverly Hills in California and uh, police actually showed up to his house and interviewed him and, and was like, uh, th this is a very fine, nice person. He seems seems okay. We just let him go. And then a couple days later, he's out on this shooting spree uh, killing people. And uh, the government has no incentive to really keep track of the mental health and the actual therape uh, therapeutic kind of status of people and individuals because, again, they get more money if there's actually more crime and more criminals out there in society. Right, and the disutility of labor, what that uh, pretty much tells us is that people are going to attempt to exert the least amount of effort for the most amount of gain. And this is just a, a natural human trait, natural trait of any sort of rational actor. So basically what tempers people from just not putting forth any or very little effort to perform a certain service or produce a certain product is the fact that if they make a service or product that's much more expensive or much lower quality than their competitor and they're not going to make any money and they're going to lose access to resources which they want to gain. That's the whole point of being in a business is to, is to gain resources or money so that you might be able to um, accommodate whatever desires you have. However, with the state, no such tempering effects from competition exist because they have that legal monopoly on that service which is enforced through, of course, aggressive interference in the marketplace which aggression itself is antithetical to the market. And therefore, when you have a monopoly on that service, which is security through the state, you're going to end up seeing results that are continually decreasing quality and increasing price because the disutility of labor is able to act without any sort of outside temperance, right? And so I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that the reason why they're sending peaceful, nonviolent people to jail through drug crimes who come out very violent and traumatized just to actually commit violent crimes more likely in the future is because, again, like you said, that warrants further expansion into our environments. That warrants hiring more police officers. That warrants maybe creating more laws even. So it's kind of a self-looking ice cream cone, and that's the whole point of the system, is not to treat crimes, not to prevent crime, and it's certainly not to protect people or their property, but it's rather meant to kind of uh, galvanize its own power to preserve its own power and to perpetually expand it. Absolutely. 
And so in the, the last five minutes or so that we have left, Chase, um, maybe you could describe a little bit, I, I don't know, I'm sure you guys don't have many disputes down there. I mean, if you're coming together with this like mind of non-coercion, non-violence, um, I'm, I can't imagine that there would be too many disputes to begin with, I mean, to even be heard of, because, you know, when a dispute occurs, it's usually because someone is actually aggressing against sure. a person or property. And so, you know, without the idea that thieving is even legitimate whatsoever, I mean, I, I can't imagine, but maybe a, a property dispute or maybe, you know, you used my uh, water bucket or, or something <laughs> like that. I mean, uh, do you guys have any disputes down there to, to even oh. speak of? We've never had any violent disputes, but I mean, of course, there's the you know, every there's every so often there there can be some drama between people like in any group. But I think it's uh, quite a bit less than other people who don't value things like empathy and communication and non-aggression as much as we do. But of course, it occurs. We are still human after all. Um, I know that we are becoming increasingly more concerned with communication and empathy. That's why we hold things like empathy circles. And of course, we'll have lots of discussions. I wouldn't say they're really conflicts like you define it, but we do have a lot of discussions and debates sometimes over the niceties of the philosophy. But all in all, like you said, we are pretty pretty much a consensus against aggression and uh, for peaceful parenting and, and for free society. Though I don't want to make that seem like that we're all part of some cult. Even though we do have common ground on our philosophical disposition, there's still a very wide spectrum on our interest and personality types and skills and things of that nature. Great, great. So um, I'm really glad to hear about that. Maybe um, maybe we could chat a little bit about some of the uh, services that are provided then, uh, you know, absent pro private property disputes. I mean, I, I'd imagine in society uh, going forward, in a voluntary society, that we would see fewer and fewer property invasions. And so property disputes and, and actually protecting property would become less demanded by people. And so we would probably see that weaning out of society and those resources would be better applied towards providing actual services that people do need and do want. Uh, what are some of the more agorist kind of um, services that you've put into place down there? Well, for instance, myself and the other co-founder, Justin Stout, we run an online business. Um, my friend Contessa here, she does hypnobirthing classes and my partner Michelle, she provides, uh, she makes beeswax candles. Uh, many of us don't pay either the full amount or any taxes on these things whatsoever. I don't want to specify who, I don't want to incriminate anybody. Uh, we have other people who are personal trainers. Uh, we have people who do like programming stuff, um, so online services. Um, we have other people who maybe sell and distribute different sorts of greenery. <laughs> so I mean, there's also I mean anything you really think of. We have artists who do um, graphic design and our other sort of art artistic work. Uh, I mean, it's hard for me to think of everything off, off the top of my head. Uh, but that's 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 kind of a glimpse into some of the things that we do. No, I was just I was just curious about your daily life down there because um, it sounds very exciting what you guys are up to and uh, I see a little bit of that when uh, of, of pork fest when I go up there there's people who are selling things making things providing services mm -hmm. and it's really uh, great to see that kind of um, spontaneous order coming about in society so well right. Chase it's been uh, it's been wonderful chatting with you we're just about at the end of the show so is there any information that you want to send out there any websites or anything. Yeah, I'll plug some things in. Uh, we're actually just updating our website, giving a huge facelift, so I would definitely recommend you guys check that out at brlp.org or blueridgelibertyproject.com. For me, you can find my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ancapchase. That's A-N-C-A-P-C-H-A-S-E. And you can find my podcast at firstdegreeliberty.podomatic.com. And I think that pretty much covers it. Well, great. Thank you so much, Chase, for coming on the show today. Um, my show is The Austrian Circle. We're going to be back next week at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I hope that you tune in. We're going to have some more interviews coming up this uh, year. And so thank you again for tuning in. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you, Ricora.